Thank you very much. I'm going to talk specifically about the design elements of the NPPF, and I think some of the other talks are going to sort of expand out to some of the other uh, areas. And I'm going to do it in a slightly sort of historical uh, way. So, in the run-up to its publication, there was a lot of hyperbole around the publication of the MPPF and the move from the old system of PPSs to the MPPF and the dramatic shortening of the uh, NPPF. Now, on the face of it, beyond changes to the tone of the guidance, which is clearly more pro-development, I think we'd have to say, than its predecessors, and its length, of course, it's hugely shorter than the PPSs that it replaced. In fact, there's very little in it that really, you could say, has substantially changed uh, from the PPSs. Planning is still plan-led. It's still essentially discretionary. The objective of planning continues to be the delivery of sustainable development. And the presumption in favour of development, you might argue, is nothing really new, given that 80 to 90 percent or so of planning applications are approved. There is already a presumption in favour of much development, most development in this country, including for major residential proposals. So, what has changed? Well, I think there's two critical things, which you might say was a, a, a bit of a new deal around planning. On the one hand, there was a move away, a deliberate move away, from national government trying to dictate everything from the centre. And as a quid pro quo, local planning authorities, you could argue, needed to take planning more seriously because they were very much being put in the hot seat of having to deliver um, planning. Driving this is a sting in the tail. That where no up-to-date plan exists, the new flexible and therefore inherently, arguably, uncertain uh, national framework would supplement local planning or supplant local planning, I should say, as the basis for decision-making. So that's quite an important change. As a consequence, local planning authorities without up-to-date plans would potentially be fatally undermined in their ability to conduct uh, local planning and uh, uh, development management. Arguably, at the same time, Planning authorities that lose control over their local planning processes have nobody to blame but themselves for not investing in appropriately in a planning service which is proactive and able to deliver um, plan making and uh, development management. The remove recognises the legitimacy and responsibility for local planning should lie locally. And that what central government can achieve will always be limited through the blunt instrument of national policy. The blunt but very powerful instrument of national policy. And I think nowhere is this more true than in the area of design, which is what I'm going to focus on. And this is a remit which I think national government, over decades, has always struggled with slightly in the face of conflicting pressures from some to do more on design, from others to do less. Now, recently, a colleague of mine was clear, had retired and was clearing out his office. And there was a whole series of documents. And leafing through one of these, I came across Circular 2866 with three short paragraphs in it, it's actually only three short paragraphs, on elevational control, penned by J. Hope Wallace, the Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Housing a Local Government back then. He says, I am directed by the Minister of Housing and Local Government to say that he has been considering the question of planning control of elevations. 
how far this contributes to the improvement of the external appearance of buildings and its effect on the quality of architectural design generally. Updating the sentiments that follow that introduction um, and taking on board the broader notion of urban design that we have today as opposed to sort of aesthetic design, which was very much the focus back then. What you see in that note from 1966 is four key principles. And from that, a, a supposition is drawn. First, control of design can help to eliminate bad design but by itself will not deliver good design. Skilled design, a skilled design process is required. We need skilled designers. <coughs> design should be judged in relation to its context. And we need a careful review process before judgments can be made about the merits or otherwise of design proposals. And all of that, we could say, sums up the fact that at that time design was considered to be important and national government should have something to say about design. In the intervening years we've seen a lot of flip-flopping in policy around design at the national scale. Uh, different policy instruments have uh, superseded and updated old ones. Sometimes the tone has been more discouraging like the famous circular 2280 uh, planning authorities should not impose their tastes on developers simply because they believe them to be superior. Sometimes it's been more encouraging. Good design should be the aim of all those involved in the development process and should be encouraged ev everywhere. PPG 1, 1997. Throughout, those four principles have in more or less held sway. And I think we can trace them through to the MPPF that we see today. So let's take the supposition first that design is important. There's a similar message which infuses the MPPF. And more so than in just the design-specific paragraphs. And those design-specific paragraphs relate the messages around the key messages around design in more or less the same way that the PPS1 did, which was published in 2005. Importantly, the key statement from PPS1 that good design is a key aspect of sustainable development and is indivisible from good planning remains in the PPP in the NPPF. Supplemented by a further phrase, um, and should contribute positively to making places better for people. That addition is important because it brings the focus to one around places, a broad notion of the quality of place, which I think is a move which, since 1997, I think governments of all political persuasions have more or less subscribed to. In other words, beyond aesthetics. It's not about aesthetics. But marking a departure from PP, uh, the uh, PPS1, the NPPF gives little explicit indication about what it actually means by good design, beyond some clear and helpful statements. For example, that it's more than aesthetics. Secure in high quality and inclusive design goes beyond aesthetic considerations. Beyond that, there is a little bit of a lack of clarity in some areas. Planning policies and decisions should address the connections between people and places. In the immediate sentence that follows, you know, what does that mean? driving McDonald's makes a very good connection between the people and the, and the place, but is it good design? Is it sustainable? And there perhaps is a lack of clarity about the vision that nationally we might have around good design. And I think this is not helped by the fact that all the cross-referencing to external guidance, 
which the old PPS had have been stripped out. So no longer reference to by design, for example, and a range of other guidance which used to exist, but which no longer does. Returning to the first of those 1966 principles, the framework clearly articulates the need for planning authorities to refuse poor design, but argues that there is a role for local authorities in securing good design through planning positively. So it's not just about refusing bad design. Actually, there is a role in helping to deliver better design. And that that is relevant to all development. It is relevant, planned positively for the achievement of high quality and inclusive design for all development, not just development in high quality places. In other words, it's suggesting that, we should, that local authorities shouldn't be waiting passively for the submission of design proposals to the, to the control process. In doing so, it recognises that planning is part of the process of shaping places. And that planners, as well as project designers and developers, need to be skilled in that process. And you need to use the range of proactive tools that they have at their disposal. A sort of positive planning is required. Like PPS1... The MPPF explicitly endorses the use of design codes, although curiously, and perhaps counterproductively, also warns that um, any additional development plan documents should only be used where clearly justified. And in the draft MPPF, the reason for that was apparent, but then removed, and that was that these additional plan documents were only considered to be relevant if they accelerated the rate of planning. Now that was removed and replaced by another statement. Supplementary planning documents should be used where they can help applicants make successful applications or aid infrastructure delivery and should not be used to add unnecessarily to the financial burdens of development. Now, I think this statement really fails to understand that using such tools should first and foremost be about delivering a proactive, certain, and less confrontational type of planning. One that places the delivery of high-quality development at its heart. And this requires some modest upfront development in the creation of these sort of proactive, positive planning tools. There's no way around it. So design codes, for example, work best if considered in the context of flexible urban design frameworks for key sites or areas. And greater encouragement for those sort of tools, I think, would be very welcome in a revised NPPF. The NPPF establishes that planners should develop robust and comprehensive policies in local plans, that set out the quality of development that will be expected for an area. And it suggests a range of factors that local plans might be expected to cover. It's quite a range of issues which are listed in various ways. <coughs> Counterintuitively, it then attempts to limit this list by stating that design policies should have... Um, falling off the edge of the slide here, should avoid unnecessary prescription or detail and should concentrate on guiding the overall scale, density, massing, height, landscape, layout, materials and access of development. So it lists a whole series of design issues and then it says, forget those. <laughs> Actually, you should concentrate on these. Much more limited range of purely physical elements. So this second list of eight physical factors not only contradicts the earlier statement in policy, um, but as I say, it seems to limit the agenda much more to a physical one, forgetting some of the more social and environmental and perceptual issues which are in the longer uh, guidance. As a historical curiosity for policy geeks like me, um, this, this list of eight, this shortened list of eight, 
without massing has its origins in a draft circular on elevation or design produced in 1983 when we were all wearing clothes like this, apparently. Um, and in that draft circular, which was never published, these seven issues, as they were back then, were fully defined. They were then omitted, those seven were omitted in Circular 3185 and PPG 1 from 1998, then made a reappearance in 1992, 1997 and 2005, and again today. So they have, a lot of these elements have a long history. They come through various policy documents over time. Each time contradicting the guidance that they set out before. Turning to the second and third of the 1996 principles, the issue of skills and context. The design skills of architects, in particular, were not explicitly endorsed in the draft text of the, uh, sorry, in the, in the text of the NPP, uh, NPPF, as they have been in some earlier policy <coughs> guidance. Although some of architects' historic preoccupations are certainly in there, for example, the, concern, the, the, uh, the controversial policy around supporting isolated dwellings of exceptional design quality in the countryside appears in the MPPF. Uh, it originally appeared in 19, uh, PPGS, uh, P, uh, PP1, uh, PPG1 of 1997. Also, wording with its origins in 1969 survives... Um, that uh, local authorities should not stifle innovation, originality or initiative and should un uh, and through unsubstantiated requirements to conform to the certain development forms or styles. And that particular wording had its origins in Development Control Note 10 of 1969. And the statement provides the sort of usual reassurance that planning shouldn't be about trying to undermine contemporary design in any way. Since 2005, it's been sub supplemented by a further statement, however, that it is proper to seek to promote or reinforce local distinctiveness. And sometimes those things might be seen to be potentially intentional. And I think certainly local authorities perhaps sometimes find it difficult to find their way through uh, these requirements around contemporary design and innovation and local distinctiveness and how do you achieve both. I think it is possible to achieve both, but these are maybe, these are complex, nuanced messages. The MPPF firmly establishes that notwithstanding the support for innovation, policy and decision-making should be based on an assessment of context, including the natural and historical built environment, and on an understanding and evaluation of its defining characteristics. And this repeats a call for character appraisal, which dates back to PPG 1 of 1997. It was little heeded back then, um, and... In many places, it's little heeded now because the resource implications for that sort of work simply are not there. And again, that creates a potential problem in delivering on some of this agenda. The framework goes on to articulate the need for communities to be involved in plan production and planning decision-making and that developers should engage communities in formulating uh, their development proposals. Applications will be expected to work closely with those directly affected by their proposals to, to evolve designs that take account of the views of the communities. Proposals that can demonstrate this in developing the design of new development should be looked on more favourably. And this, of course, represents a fundamental tenet of localism, which underpins much of the NPPF. But the potential to use design as a means to galvanise communities around development process is really not articulated in any very coherent way. The powerful role that design can potentially have in this regard. 
Turning to the fourth and final of the 1966 principles, the need for skilled and careful process of making decisions on design. Well, here the framework delivers, or delivered, a welcome boost. Local planning authorities should have local design review arrangements in place to provide assessment and support to ensure high standards of design. Now, this clearly suggests something more than standard development management arrangements, where non-specialist planning officers are charged to make decisions on design. Instead, it requires a more systematic design review process, which should, the policy suggests, be in place or procured to evaluate the design of development proposals. Independent of the other planning merits of a, uh, of a proposal. Moreover, the NPPF then suggests that in general, early engagement on design produces the greatest benefits, so design review early, and in assessing applications, local planning authorities should have regard to the recommendations from the design review panel. So it's really very clear that design review should be happening uh, and has an important role. Now, from the government, or at least the previous government, that killed off public funding to CABE, this was a surprising omission, or a surprising addition, I should say, at the time. Design Council CABE are mentioned in a footnote to the, to, to the MPPF. This element of the MPPF has certainly been important in establishing a market for design review, particularly in London, but also elsewhere around the country, and probably delivering much more design review than we ever had pre the MPPF. So it's had a significant role to play. Unfortunately, our latest survey um, design group place line survey of local planning authorities shows that over a third of local planning authorities never use design review and of those that do only a fifth use design review regularly in other words monthly or quarterly the rest it's very occasional so the vast majority of local authorities are really not using design review or hardly ever and a relatively few are using it a lot this aspect of the MPPF needs both updating to reflect the new market that has emerged and extending to make design review compulsory for all major planning schemes. To conclude, therefore, I think there's little to suggest that local authorities who engage in properly resourced, rigorous, realistic planning are any more constrained by the MPPF than they have been in the past in achieving their design objectives. And I'm focusing here specifically on design rather than other aspects of the MPPF. The design paragraphs of the MPPF, I think, could beneficially be tweaked to remo remove some of the contradictions that I've referred to, to make the messages less equivocal in their support for good design, to promote the use of um, design as a means to engage local communities in place quality in a much more proactive way, to endorse high quality external guidance, such as the recent uh, design companion for planning and placemaking, to be more positive about the use of supplementary planning uh, 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 documents, notably flexible urban design frameworks alongside codes, and to enhance the role of design review in the context of the new market for such services that has emerged, and to continue to support that. But these paragraphs, you might argue, are not fundamentally the problem when it comes to the backsliding on design quality that we've seen across England in recent years, particularly in housing. This is one developer who uh, has certainly gone very far backwards in terms of their approach to design, and, and, and others have as well in the last five years or so. Instead, 
local authority resources, design skills, commitment and proactive, or the lack of proactive urban design are the problem. This implies that the onus ultimately is on local authorities to deliver as they are the guardians of the built and natural environment. Design matters and should be a critical part of that as the MPPF makes very clear. This is ultimately a matter for local judgment and whether local authorities wish to prioritise these issues or not. And I would argue that's probably exactly the way it should be. But that's not to say that the government holds no responsibility for this black backsliding that we've seen. They do. They should set the tone that others follow beyond the fine words in policy. They need to be doing other things to promote the importance of design quality. Instead, they effectively wash their hands, largely wash their hands of design when they withdrew funding from CAVE and abandoned many of the informal levers of design governance that were so effective um, in the 2000s and which are documented in design governments, the CAVE experiment, which explores those years. So governments should show leadership, publishing better guidance, the PPG, is really very poor on design. Not a single image in it. Best practice case studies. Unequivocal ministerial pronouncements on the importance of design. Exemplar projects. Calling in projects that are poorly designed. Rejecting poor design at appeal. National design competitions. Award schemes. National design review of significant projects. We should see that once more helping to build capacity in local government, auditing national design delivery, engaging and challenging the development industry. There's lots of things that the government can do without interfering in the process of local delivery, but showing leadership on this really important issue. Thank you.